Hey guys, so I have one more speech that um, Chris wrote <clears throat> and he wants me to pass it out to you guys and you guys can forward it on or do whatever you want, um, share it. So and then after this I'm headed to bed for the night. But this one is the pharmaceutical deception. Okay, when most people hear about the Occupy movement, one question commonly pops up. How do the 1% directly affect my life on a daily basis? The question usually throws me for a loop. Personally, I guess so much seems so self-evident if you pay attention, but then it occurs to me. Most people don't pay attention. I can't say it's their fault necessarily. We're kind of conditioned that way in our society. Schools only teach brief portions of our, or portions of our history or only brief portions of historical struggles. The news only ever gives you brief portions of the story. Well, let's tell a story, shall we? This is the story of the United States healthcare system. Who makes the rules? Who do they, why do they make the rules? Who paid for them to make these rules? And most importantly, how do these rules affect you personally? The Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, approves food and drug products to be safe for consumer use after reviewing extensive data for clinical trials, supposedly. In recent years, nearly half of the FDA's $400 million budget has been paid for by drug companies. The arrangement stems from a 1992 agreement that the FDA would speed up approvals <clears throat> in exchange for user fees from industry. Sounds like legalized bribery to me. Within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, 80% of their resources are geared towards the approval of new drugs, 20% is for everything else, of which only 5% is for drug safety. You can see where their priorities lie. 50% of the money the FDA spends reviewing their drugs from the pharmaceutical companies 50% of the money the FDA spends reviewing drugs comes from the pharmaceutical companies. Can we say conflict of interest? There are actually very few long-term studies done on, pri on drugs prior to approval. Long-term studies, I guess you could say, are us. Dan Troy was previously, sorry, let me scroll down, the chief counsel to the FDA for, period, for a period of time. Prior to holding that position, he worked for a law firm that was very active in advocating for pharmaceutical industries and tobacco industry, each regulated by the FDA. In other words, he was a lobbyist for big pharma, pharma and tobacco. After his tenure as chief counsel to the FDA, he returned to lobbying for pharma, pharmaceutical companies. In plain in English, he was rewarded for his good work helping the pharmaceutical companies from the inside. This is a revolving door system that is endemic in our healthcare system. The rules are written by those who are playing the game. It is kind of like asking Kobe Bryant of the Lakers to be his own referee. No matter, no matter how you look at it, big pharmaceutical companies are pulling all the strings and they don't care who dies as a result of their unbridled greed. Then we can move on to unregulated price gouging done by the same pharmaceutical companies. 20 milligrams of Prozac costs $247, yet it only costs 11 cents to make. That is a 224,000% markup, not tripled, doubled, not tripled, but 2,240. I don't even know the correct way to say that. One more, Xanax, one milligram costs $136. They pay two cents to make it. That's a 569,000% markup. I'm trying really hard not to use profanity right now, but it's really difficult not to when you think about this stuff. It is criminal. As if the drugs themselves weren't expensive enough, one-third of Americans can't even afford medical insurance. Forget about the fact that most medication is preventable from simple diet changes that aren't widely publicized or promoted. No, it's more profitable for them if you are sick. U.S. drug prices are twice as high as they are in Europe and Canada, by the way. They still pay way too much, but we just pay way, 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 way too much. By the way, insurance companies negotiate the prices down to Europe and Canada prices. So really, the only people in the entire world that pay that much for drugs are poor, uninsured Americans. <clears throat> that seems fair and reasonable, doesn't it? Is that what they mean when they say free market? Do they mean free to exploit the most vulnerable members of our society? Next, let's briefly touch on Medicare Part D. First, the infamous donut hole. In 2010, the standard benefit required the payment of $310 deductible, and then 25% coinsured drug costs up to the initial coverage limit of $2,830. Once this coverage limit is reached, the beneficiary must pay the full cost of drugs until the total out-of-pocket expenses 
reach $4,550, excluding premiums. That coverage gap is the donut hole. A nifty little trick to screw senior citizens who are widely dependent on prescription drugs and are very likely to easily exceed the initial coverage limit of $2,830. Former Congressman Billy Towson, Republican from... Where was he from? Louisiana? Yeah, Louisiana, who steered this bill through the House, retired soon after, and took a $2 million a year job as president of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma, the main industry lobbying group. A total of 14 congressional aides quit their jobs to work for the drug and medical lobbies immediately after he passed the bill's passage. Maybe that's why they wrote in the law that Medicare is not allowed to negotiate drug prices with the pharmaceutical companies. Maybe that's why Medicare recipients pay 58% more for drugs than people who receive their drugs through the VA, the Department of Veteran Affairs, who are allowed to negotiate drug prices. By the way, it has been reported that President Obama met with Billy Towson in closed-door meetings before the passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. I refuse to use the Fox, whom, Fox News term, Obamacare. Maybe secret meetings with pharma lobbyists could have had something to do with the disappointing way it turned out, huh? In conclusion, to answer the question, how did the 1% affect my day on the day, my day-to-day -day life? In the instance of healthcare, healthcare, they control what drugs you take, whether or not the drugs are safe, how much we pay for drugs, what laws are passed to regulate the system, what laws are passed to supposedly protect protect us consumers, and more importantly, which laws aren't passed. In a nutshell, they decide they decide who can have health care and who can't. They decide what kind of health care you get. They decide who lives and who dies. I'd say that's a pretty big deal. I'm sorry if this is getting a little long, but the scary part is we barely even scratched the surface. On a positive note, we can have <clears throat> a say in our health. The best kept secret is that diet and exercise are still the number one preventative measure anyone can take in avoiding getting sucked into all this mess. Although, one per although the 1% do control our food too, but that's another topic on another paper. But for those who diet and exercise alone are not enough, we must fight. It may be cliche to say, to, but united we stand, so we must unite. We have important things to accomplish, so let's get to work. I implore every one of us in the movement to not let us get sidetracked by petty squabbling over party affiliation, religion, or dare I say whether or not you're an anarchist. We may all be different, and that is okay. In fact, that's what's so great about us. That is our strength. We are united by morality, not by political affiliation. We are the 99% and mor morality shall prevail. And like I said, share away if you agree. If not, just ignore it. Sorry. Okay, bye guys.